Thank you, Tony. Thank you, President Sparks, the Architectural League, and Florian for making this uh, evening possible. Um, in short, tonight's lecture will be about three buildings, uh, but more importantly about the relationship of those three buildings to uh, the space of learning, if you will, and how there is a some form of reciprocity between the institutions we try to cultivate and the spaces they foster. At the same time, all of this is happening at around 2008 when the entire economy of the world is beginning to crumble and we're coming to terms with the fact that we have to lay off half of the office and uh, we come together in a pact and decide whether we're going to do that or just do 14 competitions and see what happens. We did exactly that and lo and behold the three competitions we win are all schools of architecture. The problem with schools of architecture is that your audience is 500 to 1,000 students, half of whom are more intelligent than you are, and a spirited faculty who are your best critics. So in fact, while there are three schools of architecture, they involve a constituency that is uh, substantial uh, in its uh, rigors and its disciplines. Moreover, in a school of architecture, it brings to the fore the idea that uh, a building uh, is, as always, a didactic instrument. It has something to do uh, in terms of its pedagogical missions. This is also all happening at a moment in time where the role of technology uh, is actually completely transforming the way that we live our lives. We all know that ceci to ara cela, uh, what it did to architecture, uh, but now we are being prompted to think about what technology is doing to our spaces of learning. With online uh, education becoming more and more prevalent, with uh, uh, information and knowledge uh, being accessible, the question is why should we go to the university? It's all there. But there's a relationship between spaces of pedagogy and their organizations, and like, I'd like here to interrogate what that role is. Here, the classic uh, classroom, uh, uh, a person at the lectern, these, only, uh, these also come with certain rituals. Uh, in fact, there's an ideological dimension to the way in which uh, we have been taught, I myself remember nap time as a kind of mandatory aspect of, uh, of being educated. And yet now, uh, the space of education is everywhere. Uh, it's on our commute uh, between Boston and New York, it's at the home, it's at Starbucks, and effectively, we're always connected. So then what is the role of the campus when we're connected to the world? and in fact multiplying our audiences at every given time. Does that reduce the efficacy of the space of the institution or does something else happen? Consider some of the redundancies of looking at your laptop and looking at the screen at the, certain, uh, at the same time. Only two people have what's on the screen, on their screens, the rest are looking at babies and cats and dogs and so forth. You can see the one on the right has that sweet little baby. I think of some of those moments that you and I take for granted, a simple seminar table, uh, in terms of the Harkness table, the, the infamous uh, table in Exeter, that in essence for the first time established parity between the professor and the students, uh, not only putting them eye to eye, but also having the students essentially dictate uh, the narrative of the day. Uh, these uh, things matter, and in fact, as we begin to examine parliamentary style of engagement and ways that we organize our spaces, we realize that these spaces of pedagogy uh, have a huge impact on the way that we think. Some of the teal spaces at MIT and some of the other schools uh, and the way in which they connect us to distances far off, but also enable a breakdown of scale for 
project-based learning and interaction uh, with different time zones all at the same time. All of you have done a fair share of uh, corporate Skypes and WebExes and things like that. But the space that has impacted us maybe more than anything uh, is uh, some of the Fab Lab spaces that has been created by Neil Gershenfeld. And the idea that the educational process and the research that we do has a much more hybridic uh, quality to it. Uh, it is about scholarship, uh, it is also about interaction, it is about making, uh, and it is about the accidents that happen in between those times. More than anything, it is Gershenfeld that placed the situation of the Fab Lab in a physical space, knowing fully well that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, instruction from Munich or from Italy or from Kenya uh, becomes part of the ecology of education in, a, in an expanded field. Now consider this, you don't have to wait anymore to, for Wednesday or Thursday night to, uh, to watch Friends. Uh, the new kind of entertainment that you get, you just stream it, or you download all of it at one time, and, uh, and have access to it at any time you want, which is not that different in, than the way that we kind of ride our zip cars or share our bicycles and so forth. So why is it that we take for granted the bundled education of the four-year curriculum? Why is it that we cannot imagine a curriculum that is debundled and inserted within it uh, a range of other uh, years for internships, for research, for travel, and any, any other thing? Some people may uh, be able to, to learn in three years the curriculum of a four-year. And essentially, uh, online education is making that possible. But the question remains then, what is the role of the university? Well, as it turns out, after all of the studies that we've done, and after all of the schools that we've studied, it makes the space of the institution, the, its architecture, and its design a place of destination like no other. If 100,000 people have access to Harvard University, only maybe 10,000 have access to this space of interaction at any given moment. And in essence, that is the message that we got from all these three schools of architecture, which in fact uh, happened under very different regimes and different cultures. The spaces of architecture are not alien to us. I've always loved Sa uh, the, the Sao Paulo School of Architecture, not only for its material and morphological properties, but with the idea, the prospect that uh, it is a civic space, uh, it is a space of manifestation, and it is where people come to change the world. And in fact, this is one of those instances in the 70s. At the GSD, where I myself spent some time, the idea that a school uh, may be a, a place of transformation, that uh, the theater uh, and the spectacle, if you like, of design uh, beyond the space of the individual is a collective project, a space of design under one big roof, a factory of production. In Cornell, uh, it really maybe doesn't respond to um, the digital moment, except that brilliantly REM produces an, um, uh, an addition to two buildings that is larger than the sum of its parts. This is the first time I've seen an addition define the host. Here's a moment where the parasite essentially becomes more important. I can't hide my own devotion and my weakness for Gesamt uh, Kunstwerk. And here Yale uh, acts as a moment in which the very civic moments of education and learning come together in a stacked series of public spaces from the auditorium to the library, the exhibit hall, and most importantly, the crit space. The one platform of education that probably we only we share with each other, that is the space of debate and the space where students and faculty come together on the same level 
and interrogate the role of representation and generation uh, in the context of changing the world. Here, also note the way in which all of the other spaces of classroom and studio space are a thick crust, not only on top but on the side, bringing light in and creating uh, a donut, essentially a frame for the spectacles that happen within. Our own research stems from uh, a fascination from material studies. And these um, installations over the last 20, 30 years are an emblem of a focus on the role in which uh, construction plays in the transformation of the built environment. And as part of the venture led chair that transformed our practice, uh, we were able to be shortlisted and subsequently win the expansion of the School of Architecture uh, for the master's program. We were given the Hinman building to play with, a curious 1920s building that is a real hybrid construction system with brick, concrete, steel, and wood. Really, we inspected the two ways in which conservation, preservation, renovation, and essentially intervention come to play a dynamic relationship with each other with respect to this modernist building that had to be respected. As a public space, uh, the building was to serve as a multi-purpose hall with studios, exhibitions, and, uh, and assemblies at the bottom. But in fact, the School of Architecture is composed of many buildings, uh, also by Heffernan, that really have a remarkable relationship to the central space of the campus, which used to be a parking lot and was subsequently transformed into the main quad so that the Hinman building was actually a threshold between the quad and the fabrication space towards the back. I don't need to tell you what the space of the studio is, but in fact, it's a 24-7 space. It's a space of culture, uh, technical support, research, and whatever. I think of the Bunny Lounge at RISD, mm -hmm. that is the whatever. But essentially also we're witnessing a transformation of the workspace at the individual level, uh, level of the table where the computer, uh, model making, and a great range of other things are beginning to impact the quality of space and what is maybe the most expensive aspect of architectural education, which as it turns out is real estate. We inherited this magnificent and, if you like, sublime space of the high bay, and the real question of this project was what to do in that, because we were given a program that would eventually stuff the interior uh, of that space. But we're reminded by the Tate how that too is a civic space, a public space. Or within that, depending on organization, one can produce a micro-urbanism. Or depending on the qualities that one inserts in it, a space of the sublime. But luckily, because precisely this coincided with the, um, uh, the uh, economic downturn, so too was the program. And the budget, if I'm not wrong, went from 15 million to 11 million. Uh, and in collaboration with Dan Gallagher, my partner, we were, went back to the drawing table to essentially determine how is it that we're going to insert pieces within this high bay. And very quickly we understood one fundamental uh, opportunity. If we turn the building upside down conceptually, we begin to read the trusses above as its new foundation and the gantry crane repurposed as a new support for a new studio space. So essentially, by lifting everything off the ground, the ground itself becomes flexible to be able to make lateral connections between the PhD programs, the exhibition spaces, the fabrication labs, and a range of other spaces that need to be constantly reconstituted in the name of flexibility. So if in, a give, in any given day the, the studio space uh, is filled with the clutter of studio uh, spaces, the studio desks, the roof essentially acts as the foundation for the studio, a second means of egress, the lights that then go up into the air when people are building large installations, and essentially secure the lateral 
uh, connections that we can make not only to the ground floor but also to the second floor. The suspension systems then become part of a language, of a filigree, if you like, of tectonic elements that uh, in a way undermine the tectonic stability of those things that uh, hold up traditional architectures. Everything is in suspense. The guillotine wall uh, on the way to the crit space, the second means of egress kind of shrink-wrapped uh, uh, around extend mesh, the suspended studio that lands on a kind of conference area, bringing people together, and the whole uh, uh, medley of, of elements on a raised floor system that then brings uh, electricity and services to the space. The stair then and the materials that are being adopted here are very much grafted from the existing architecture. This is not one of those scarpa moments where the delamination of materials is articulated between the old and the new. There's a, a very devious way in which all of the materials come into a moment in which they repurpose or extend the logic of existing conditions. And yet within the logic of um, conventions and um, off-the-shelf items like uh, this uh, spiral staircase, there is the figural moment where we get to create uh, the figure uh, as part of its safety mechanisms. And most importantly, the anticipation of what actually happens there. Luckily for us, you never really get to say what happens in any school. Uh, scripting education could be the worst thing that we do. And so here, uh, in this space, which is really formed around an idea of uh, flexibility, uh, is the space of graduation. It is the space of the fabrication of installations, it's the space of film, the Beaux-Arts Ball, and a range of other things that happen. In fact, currently, the arrangement of desks there have absolutely nothing to do with any of the versions that we drew for them. Most importantly, uh, a building that was a research building in the past and highly insular and closed off to its context becomes a threshold between two major spaces. The quad on the right-hand side uh, with the main stairs that take you in, but the huge garage doors on the back that now open up and, uh, and essentially roll out a large test mock-ups and so forth in the back. Note here, I like to say that we literally ran out of money uh, at the end of this project uh, and didn't have enough money for the labor of polishing the RESE of the research building, uh, giving its uh, appropriate name as a school of architecture. I like to think of the MSD, the Melbourne School of Design, as a kind of distant cousin of the Georgia Tech project. Um, you'll see in a second, but the dean uh, of the school there, Thomas Cavan, was a central protagonist in enabling uh, that competition to happen and was the motor behind its conceptual strategies. In a school that was in heavy competition with RMIT, which is a design school, uh, Melbourne School of Design was known for its research, but it never had a design studio. For, so for its first mission was to create a design studio of the future. He wanted an academic environment where connections between different disciplines could come into conversation, a living building that spoke to its context and its urban environment, but also was sustainable and ecologically uh, resilient, but most of all also another building that established a meaningful relationship with its pedagogies as a built uh, uh, construct. The studios then were very important for us. We had conceptualized this as a crust on top of the campus, a big mat organization through which one could imagine the light uh, of the uh, Australian sun coming down into the public areas of the auditoria, the library, and so forth. But upon first inspection, within less than a month, it became clear that the one thing they could not afford is a studio space. 
And so we were sort of left high and dry. What does it mean to design a school of architecture and design without a space of design, a studio space? From an urbanistic perspective, what was important to recognize were the beautiful neo-Georgian courts that articulate uh, the landscape of the campus, and also recognizing that our building has a deep footprint. There is no uh, front, there is no back. It is a building of four sides, and once expanded, can produce a courtyard, an atrium space in the middle, that brings all of the various elements of classrooms, offices, exhibitions, libraries together around a hollow core. The big question for us was whether there was a way in which we could carve the studio space out of the net to gross area of the building. So if you had originally conceived of a studio as the crust above the building, what would it mean to rotate that down and make a vertical studio? Expanding the corridor dimension from about five or six feet to about nine feet, knowing fully well that you could double dip and extend the studios into the space of the crit spaces at the bottom, into the classrooms on the second level, into the master's research uh, areas on the third, and then finally into the PhD levels. So the studio space is essentially a malleable um, sponge that begins to soak its relationship to the various areas in which it will expand. And so, essentially, we're erecting a studio, something that you and I uh, normatively would imagine as a face-to-face -face relationship, now begins to happen vertically, uh, but also in relationship to the programs behind it with flexible screens, doors, and other mechanisms that enable a kind of kinetic connection between the front and the back. From an urbanistic perspective, this is a building, as I said, that has no front or back. From Swanson Street, a direct con a connection to the Southern Lawn and the Administration Building, the Elizabeth Murdoch Building, mother of Rupert, as I like to say, uh, with a connection through the building, uh, as well as the atrium connecting back uh, towards um, the campus on the north uh, east, the delivery systems, the fab lab beginning to uh, gain a presence in a courtyard in the north, and of course at the end the main quad of the campus, the concrete lawn connecting to the student union and reactivating what is called the Joseph Reed facade, a bank that was placed in front of our building some 50 years ago that became part of the competition brief. So effectively, the strategy was to absorb the context by extending the ground plane through the building and then creating a piano nobile, one floor up, that becomes the new ground for the studio space. The space of the campus then absorbs the various activities that happen, uh, the southern lawn in relationship to the library, the concrete uh, lawn in relationship to the gallery on the western edge, uh, on the eastern edge, uh, this time again a guillotine wall that is over 60 feet wide opens up to ventilate the space on the inside in relationship to the Elizabeth Murdoch building. And finally a grand entry that brings you into the space of the school from Swanston Street. And of course a connection uh, uh, between the, the public promenade that is the ba at the base of the building and the new design studio as you peek through an oculus above. Now this has turned out to be a space for the entire campus. The auditoria that are below the ground are used by the School of Engineering, Anthropology, Sociology, and so the academic environment in which they had hoped to develop a different kind of conversation is beginning to happen through programming also not just the spaces that they offer. The connection to the studio then uh, is done on a diagonal looking up into the studio space, up at this new ceiling, which is essentially a wooden LVL system that spans over 22 meters. What was important for us, given that we only had hot desks and 
temporal studio spaces was to create a series of dedicated studio spaces in the center of this hall. And speaking back to historical antecedents, the Tempietto, the British Arts, or, or Gary's uh, um, Berlin building, the idea of a kind of totemic artifact uh, within the context of our building, but to do so in a way that is a direct extension of the logic of the building and its materiality. And as we were trying to think this through, John Wardle, uh, our partner down under, began to tell me about Alan's book, Upside Down at the Bottom of the World, about D.H. Lawrence arguing infinitely with his wife about the horrible experience they were having uh, down in New South Wales. I was also watching The Simpsons at that time and the whole logic of the, the water going in the opposite direction. And uh, I thought immediately of Georgia Tech and, and what we had learned there and the idea of finding a way in which we develop a structural system on the roof that spans 22 meters a coffering system that gives lateral bracing to it in between, giving indirect sunlight for natural daylighting. And then from this compressive and heavy system of timber, begin to suspend a structural system that goes down one studio, another studio, and finally the third studio on the, uh, on the bottom that does not touch the ground, but also tectonically imagining how you're going from a heavy system to a light system, literally suspending and hovering over the floor that remains open for events, uh, lectures, installations, and so forth. I'm going to skip the animation and go directly to the organization of the building, which essentially has uh, a an unequal distribu distri distribution of dollars per square foot, with the most expensive in its core, and then the studio spaces become raw concrete spaces, and then an elaboration of the skin that then tempers the severity of the sunlight uh, uh, on the east, the north, and the west side, essentially creating a series of, um, uh, of rings. The core of the building is then uh, constructed out of a coffering. Uh, uh, I should say that all of this building was scheduled to be built in 24 months, but in fact happened in 18 because of the, the advent of prefabrication and off-site construction. So most of everything you're going to be seeing was built somewhere else. Brought to the site at four or five in the morning with a roof that was erected in less than two weeks suspending the studio from above, essentially from heavy systems and laminate systems to produce a kind of antithesis with the bulge of the ceiling, the, the, the roof, an inhabitable roof, bringing the forces down while also articulating an acoustic system underneath it, which is composed of those veneers uh, to which I refer it. At the same time, a staircase, which becomes another didactic instrument. Not only uh, does it need to ascend the building, but give you choices as to where you're going, on the north or the south. So the Y stair essentially is the bridge itself. Uh, the railings become the truss. And after we saw the construction of the truss, we realized that all of the acoustic lining that we put on it, which was part of the necessity of the brief, may be something that we can forego, at least in the underbelly, to begin to reveal parts of its construction. And so while the acoustic liners were able to go on the, on the edges, we, 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 we left the raw structure um, uh, on the underbelly, what uh, Wardle likes to call the, the, the raw and the cooked. The promenade of the stair then has the ability to become almost a theater, a series of casual spaces that become part of the social spaces as they overlap going up the building. 
Most importantly, as we come to understand structural systems and the heavy toil that they have on natural resources, we discovered the cross-laminated timber, not as the structural system alone, because some of our loads were just too much, but the possibility of hybrid, hybridizing that with metal rebar and actually using the cross-laminated timber as the formwork for the building and then be, it becoming together as a sandwich system that then uh, is the floor space that builds up the decks as you go up the building. So again, the uh, second floor is the conference tables and model making tables outside of the studio spaces, the drafting spaces with laptops and so forth, a space beyond that with the master's program next to it, and finally, uh, the lounges, the seating spaces, and the crit spaces on the top with the PhD programs, making sure constantly that the undergraduates, the masters, and the PhD programs are, are mixing on the vertical axis. All of this, again, shrink-wrapped against this uh, mesh that effectively denies you of the presence of railing systems. Uh, what we wanted uh, most of all was to eliminate the, the barrier of the guard and really bring everybody uh, to the mesh itself and speak to the uh, opposing side. Uh, in this instance, then, all of the drafting and social spaces come together um, uh, along the edge. The skin of the building, then, is composed of a series of uh, corrugated zinc panels, uh, custom perforated in relationship to the views and the orientations that they sponsor, uh, but effectively they come to uh, receive the light but also enable views out of it from various directions uh, with a very simple tooling system that then rotates to give all of the different patterning systems that are available to the eye when you look outside. Also, because of the corrugation of the zinc, we were able to minimize the strut systems so that uh, they're not, uh, 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 there are no horizontals al along your eye line. They're below your feet and above your head so that the structural span essentially is able to, to get around that. And finally, the precast system for which Australia is very well known, a large monolithic system that uh, gets exposed in its own right on the southern edge, which is, you know, in our, in our world, a northern edge, uh, where uh, the variegated window system of the studio spaces becomes articu articulated and finally ascends to uh, the large studio space on the top that looks over downtown Melbourne. The Joseph Reed facade then is that curious oddity that for over 50 years was boarded up and smacked up against the old architecture building. Part of the mission of this competition was also to examine how is it that we could revive this facade to actualize it and to begin to use it as a threshold into the building. Obviously opening its windows and doors was a first step. But understanding how its relationship to the content that it holds is not only ambiguous, but an imperative to begin to uh, form it with something. You will note in a second what I mean about this. First and foremost, we had to understand the building, essentially decomposing the classical language, understanding the thickness of the wall, and coming to recognition that in fact, I'm sorry, it's uh, not showing that well, does not have a structural system to add a columnar system in the back, but also understanding that we need to penetrate it to bring windows, oculi, doors into it. Most of all, it would not be able to stand on its own, so it needs lateral stability. And to transform the beam on the side into an occupiable space that bridges from the main staircase and the main circulation into the facade so you are inhabiting the facade in itself. Essentially connecting into the window and essentially um, negotiating the geometries of the facade with the geometry of the beam that brings you back into the building. Uh, uh, volumetrically spanning over the exhibit space at the base of the building. 
a classroom, it's a social space, it's the space of the window, and essentially brings together yet another episode uh, within the building. I don't like to do this, the idea of showing buildings inhabited with people. I know it's what we're here to serve, but I don't like to use this as an alibi for the success of the building. But the problem is that the building is a huge success. And <laughs> that's not only the result of good design, I suspect, it's the result of being hungry. When you don't have something and you're given it for the first time, they will make it work at all cost. And so the idea of the vertical studio uh, is actually occupied 24 seven around the clock and, and maybe most delightfully, not just by schools, uh, by the students of design, but people from the rest of the campus uh, are coming here. Apparently I have no internet, sorry. Um, and it's become a vibrant social space uh, for the school. So I'll now end with a, a very torturous project that we're undergoing right now. Uh, for the Daniels faculty in Toronto, which is smack in the middle of the slide, the circular space called Spadina Circle, uh, is a fascinating location uh, at the southwestern corner uh, of the campus. Um, the challenges of this project really had to do with the renovation and, and the relaunching of Knox College, which has undergone many generations of, of programs with many uh, smaller structures built in the back that needed to essentially be demolished in order to revive the building. Uh, very, very low budget, uh, so compactness was the name of the game. And we had to look within the logic of the existing building, a kind of formal logic that would extend it and wrap in uh, onto itself. Uh, a, circular, a circulatory donut that uh, by virtue of completing its circulation for the first time in history gives a facade to the northern portion of Spadina Circle. Within that, the insertion of the services on all four corners, bathrooms, stairs, elevators, and so forth, and effectively framing what used to be a courtyard into a multi-purpose hall where most of the events such as this, but also other classroom spaces can occur once divided. The challenge of this building, of course, is the Daniels uh, faculty uh, is observant not only for architects, but landscapes, uh, architects, um, urbanists. And much of this building is really about its negotiation with its urban context. So at, while at one level this is about the restoration of an existing neo-Gothic building, it also has to do with the efficient way in which we develop an addition in the back that serves as a base for its spire but also anticipates landscape additions and programmable additions in the future at that base that carve spaces into the building, but also let light in as one begins to imagine different kinds of Claire stories that bring uh, light and air to the expanded spaces of the urban center, the fabrication lab, the gallery, and so forth. So this is a project really not only about the building in the center, but the landscape that evolves around it and the kind of uh, uh, circumnavigation of the circle itself, which right now is essentially a traffic circle. Understanding the logic of the existing building, these expansions are very much part of the logic of the existing uh, pavilions that are at the corners, all of which serve as either classrooms or uh, or, or halls of some kind, but essentially the old building serves as offices and classrooms while the new building serves as the grand studio space. Symbolically, it operates on the north and south, but practically the doors are on the east and west. So there's a kind of knot that needs to occur as you translate the orientation of the east-west to the north and the south. And effectively, what used to be the front door is now a new tray, a kind of pedestal for the cafe that overlooks the lake towards the south, uh, soaking in the southern sun. 
What's most important then is a street, a new street, much like uh, Melbourne, that draws in all of the main public activities, the library, the Grand Hall, the Fab Lab, all of the student lockers, the cafe, and various other administrative levels, so that while the main axis is served from a symbolic level, uh, we're drawn into the site along a research edition that is its arcade that brings you into the building, while serving also on the opposite side as a larger plaza oriented back towards the campus. The street then is really lined with activities, not only the student lockers, but all of the other things that constitute its activity, and most importantly, an oculus to northern Spadina bringing into the darkest core of the building a some amount of light, not only on axis, but diagonally up as we begin to mine other forms of light uh, out of the top of the building, which is a major component uh, of this building. This building, while being a very dense nugget, is in fact a series of landscape plates, looking at the roof as a landscape, the studio level at the top floor as a landscape that peels down to bring light into the central hall, and of course the base of the building that peels down in order to make a double height space in the fab lab. What was the courtyard then becomes the grand flexible hall with these saddlebags on either side, crit spaces, uh, amphitheater spaces, lounges and so forth that bring the light all the way from the top and into this empty shell in the middle that also is divisible by three. From a technological point of view, we were able also to research a little bit certain means and methods that would not only lighten the structure, but also put old resources to new work, uh, using old kayaks to essentially give a bubble deck uh, to produce a flat ceiling underneath under which we could mount flexible walls without coffering systems and so forth, as well as create the amphitheater that is going up. The large studio hall then has a kind of theatrical relationship to the grand hall for overflow of lectures, which can also be screened off when the long door is closed off. And most importantly, the idea that this space is really about flexibility also. It's divisible by two, by three, by one, in different orientations that begins to speak to its context in different ways. And then, going from the public level, a more restrained connection to the studio space, tight, narrow, to a monumental space of the studio, that once and for all produces a prospect that connects to Spadina North. Essentially a beacon from the north with a kind of foreground of landscape elements. Part of my fascination with this project comes ultimately in the way in which the roof had to be conceptualized and reformed. Thought in relationship to the Firth and Fourth Bridge, what we needed to do is to translate a generic structural concrete grid that goes up to the third floor into a long span structure, essentially evolve it into a shell structure, using essentially the cantilevers from two sides to, to conjoin the center to essentially span what is 100 feet. Riffing off of a house that we were doing in southern France, we realized that the span of this building was not going laterally, but actually longitudinally along the length of the house. And we wondered what would it mean to rethink our roof in that axis, not this axis. We did a variety of studies that don't really show up well, but essentially we realized that it's not enough to span. Because if you span and the water drains in the center, 
that drainage pipe is tantamount to another column, and that's exactly what we are trying to, to forego. So we had to think hard about what are the systems of concrete shells, and we had to put the skylights on the edge with a kind of oculus on the center that then gets a slight glass roof that pushes all of the water drainage system together on the east and west edge. So effectively, this is a structural system that is working in tandem with the daylighting system and the hydrological management of the entire roof. So this landscape is essentially a kind of uh, smart system that uh, tessellates the organization of the roof. Well, we've seen all of this and we've seen how these structures work, but we also know the construction system uh, today and the ways in which between project managers, contractors, lazy people, uh, nobody's invested in the problems of architecture. So as I was boarding a plane to go to Melbourne, uh, I got the call that your roof has been cut off. It's now going to be flat with a series of nice round skylights. True to the tradition of the installations we've done in the office, we decided to build the roof. And also demonstrate to them that even if this were done with a steel system, essentially with a series of single uh, straight struts, all of this could be fabricated as a ruled surface, a developable surface with sheet material and plastered over. In fact, we found a system that could put the heating and cooling system in the radiant slab that is part of its ceiling, which is eventually how the building evolved. And if that were to seem like a compromise, I find it nothing but, because in a way, uh, buildings uh, somehow have a way of surviving when and if the idea is actually a good one. And in this case, um, as much as Tony talks about uh, our care for craft, this is one of those instances where we were guaranteed the absence of any uh, cooperation from the construction team. And so th the best craft we've gotten so far is out of good paint everywhere that conceals all of the, the detailings that were never built the way we had imagined them. But in fact, I think of this as one of those buildings that, that as a party is so powerful that even the way in which it becomes a white box uh, transcends the terms of its material conditions. I won't talk to this. I'll let Florian speak to this later on. But essentially, this is one of those buildings that uh, undergoes many transformations in order to become intelligent about its use of resources. And this is a whole other axis of discussion we can have, but about the idea of reviving old buildings as a very uh, economic and sustainable strategy, the way in which the building, tight as it may be, as a piece of landscape begins to have intelligent relationships with the urban context that it serves, uh, the light, the sun, and the ventilation, uh, essentially minimizing uh, the use uh, of electricity to the extent that is possible, uh, and understanding that this building is part of a larger ecology of access of not only students that come here, but people that go through the building to go to the Kensington neighborhood, people that bike here or use the streets, uh, streetcar, but that the scale at which we conceptualize a building is at many. It's at the regional scale, at the architectural scale, and at the micro section, uh, engaging the possibility of maximum operable windows through displacement ventilation with a raised floor system, using the ceilings as essentially light baffles to bounce light off and of course the most important determinant of the shape of the ultimate roof was the stormwater harvesting that comes down and then spreads across to create in somewhat of an oblique way an idea about the facade as a communicating element uh, of the design itself. Essentially, a new reveal is placed 
in the gap between the old and the new to essentially become an indicator of how the building operates symbolically. So effectively, if you think about Neo-Gothic, one thing we did not want to do was to extend and emulate its architecture, but we had to draw out of it certain characteristic features that it may somehow speak to it indexically. And if you think about the way in which the Gothic operates as a skyline, then all of a sudden the way in which uh, the reveal, the downspout, its irrigation of the, of the landscape and the torquing of the roof as a manifestation of the ways in which the building is performing is a central part uh, of its argument. Now in closing, invariably a person like myself is put in a building like this uh, of a mighty legacy with uh, a renovation of its own, a transformation that is part and parcel of its legacy. Uh, it is uh, the monument that uh, John Nahedek uh, developed and he had precise ideas about the organizations of space that he too had to think about in relationship to each other, the workshop on the fourth floor being one of them and the ways in which that brings together the schools of the uh, architecture and arts uh, sandwiched uh, around them. I'm also reminded of the ways in which his pedagogies come to inspire us and even uh, burden us uh, some 30 years later. But the nine square grid remains a classical problem that we deal with on a daily basis. So instead of ending on a big message, what I'll say is that while we deal with the problems of the world, of ecology, of urbanism, of the difficulties of the building industry, and the ways in which we interact with them critically, we're also invested in microscopic aspects of the architectural discipline to which I am still very much invented. And these are just three or four snippets. They do not define everything, but they define uh, the meaningfulness of becoming to grips with the part to whole relationships that are part of the architectural craft as an intellectual craft. As you may note, a lot of our work is invested in the right side meaning the way in which the fragments of units of construction conspire to produce systems that create larger figures. So while the bowl on the left is a platonic ideal that creates a form and a vessel, it is the nest that we've become invested in. And the means and methods is something that in many ways have been abdicated during the postmodern period and the deconstruction period where we went to school. So the, the presence of construction was not actually part of our education. We brought that back into the academy. I'm also reminded of the way that even when you have smooth construction, at the end everything is composed of, as an aggregate. Here in the house in Saint-Tropez, the enlargement of that very aggregate along the length of that wall transforms from the smoothness of an interior living room to the stone walls of France in the distance. Our ability to gauge and establish a relationship with the building industry is one of those moments where we have a different kind of agency than we otherwise would. And despite all of the delight or shape or form we can bring to architecture, I was reminded in the Western House that in architecture, drawing is not just a pictorial act. It is always already an act of construction. Here, the corrugated metal that you see with its vertical lineaments are a testament to the idea, the very idea of how a ruled surface is formed. And therefore, the way that it undergoes different geometries is precisely because of a theorem that this drawing is now proving. The line at the top is the same length as the line at the bottom. And finally, the idea that construction, one way or the other, no matter how smooth it is, is a wrestling with the idea of aggregation. 
and in this case, how the discovery through leverance, that is not the brick that we're looking at, but the space between the brick, the mortar line, and how its expansion and contraction from a running bond to a Flemish bond may bring into this structural system the idea of an environmental and illumination system. So with that in mind, uh, I invite Florian to the stage where we can expand this discussion. Thank you. seconds still. <laughs> Those without questions leave. Please, as you wish. So, I am here to kick off a conversation which hopefully will be a conversation which everybody can um, engage in, as we were reminded at the beginning of this um, evening, this is a, a, a room of great debates and great exchange, and so I suggest we start and then we uh, engage the rest of the audience within this conversation. Um, I'd like to start with a very simple question, but maybe one that also um, 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 leads us into a larger conversation. Um, which is, you did 14 competitions, you won three, what were the other 11? <laughs> we, we were turned on to Belgium at the time through Alexander de Hoge, and he somehow forged a relationship between us and the, the national architect of, uh, of the time, and we entered uh, one competition after the other, uh, and came in second every time, which is tantamount to coming last. And so those were the lion's share of those competitions, yeah. as well as a few others that uh, where we had al almost no chance. And as you know, the competition system works only if there's shortlists. Shortlisted competitions, open yeah. competitions, just don't work. Yeah. Uh, it's it's the odds. Uh, in these cases, um, really what there was was the right alignment of stars. In, in Georgia Tech, our history with the venture chair was central to it. In Melbourne School of Design, we did not know about it at the time, but that there was an, a hidden element about uh, having somebody from the Ivy League to be part of a team. And the difference was that we did not elect a local team to work with us. The local team was a bona fide and extraordinary design team led by John Wardle. Yeah. And we partnered together and essentially erased all boundaries between their studio and our studio. So we, it was a true collaboration. And then um, in Toronto it was just pure luck and great fortune, but essentially it, it is a familiar school and we were known entities, but I, I couldn't believe that we beat some of the people that we beat. So, um, so in short, those were the other competitions, yeah. primarily the, the Belgian ones were the ones that it's, of consequence. It's funny, um, you, when you asked me to do this, you said there, there, we, we have some um, possible overlap, and I don't know if it's the desire to shrink wrap things or meshes or what have you. But, um, but I actually realize, and now I realize we were also in those Belgian competitions, so there there is some, um, uh, some, something as well. But I, I, and this maybe leads to um, uh, the second question, which is, um, the, the interest, there is an interest, there is a, there is an interest in making things real. There is a, there in, there's an interest in materiality, in the performance of materials and engaging with them. 
industry, there is, a, there is an, uh, an interest in understanding how things work and how to turn things into realities. Um, you came to my class at the GSD, uh, I think two years ago, which is about a, a professional practice class, and you spoke about your um, biography, your, your path, basically, to, to coming here. And I'm curious if you think that there is a relationship between your um, very um, uh, the sort of background that lives between different cultures uh, and your movement through your life and this pursuit of making things real. Well, or of pragmatism, in a way, of, of, of yeah. It's a, it's a loaded question because when you don't come from a place, uh, you don't have a reality. Uh, you're, you're always mediated between some form of translation from what you inherit from your parents or the, the sparse amount of time that you live in one culture or another. I happen to grow up in Pakistan, in South Africa, in England, in Iran. And the patchwork that defined those realities were so thin that in many ways uh, my mediation to communication, to building realities was effectively through representation or through drawing. And so I would say that what I share possibly with the audience is that all architecture is an act of translation. The tension that you see between the spaces and forms that we discuss and the words that describe them uh, are all uh, acts that are trying, that are attempting to define a reality. At the same time, the pragmatism that you speak of in engaging reality is only part of it because our interest, of course, is not to make reality, is to transcend the terms of reality because we're given a heavy dose of reality on a daily basis and maybe we just don't like it. I mean, that they're insufficient. And so th this is why uh, we speak of architecture as having the possibility to have agency, to transform our consciousness or to inspire in some way or the other. Uh, even in those instances where you cannot articulate an idea, uh, even the embodiment of a sensation uh, is that is the definition of that reality. So for me, it's very important not only the idea of uh, defining a reality, but altering reality. I'm wondering if we should continue on this. <laughs> I think it's very, I mean, it's very, um, uh, the, maybe it can tie into the, the in, I don't know if you want to talk about the program here. Um, the, you said in your, in your talk, you said the, the, the worst thing um, we can do, or scripting education is the worst thing we could do. This is what you said with the, with the Georgia building. Um, the school here has its own history, its own legacy, its own uh, figures, its own um, characters, uh, even its own fictions. And, and I think your um, uh, the, the the work you show, the work you have done, the work also pre so these three projects. Um, they they seem to come from a different lineage, maybe one that it has to do with material, with assembly, with construction, with making. And I'm wondering how do you, or how do you see the reconciliation, or the re, or maybe the reconstructing of a new reality also here in the school, as you described, also the, the sort of um, transformation of the reality outside into sort of a new reality. How do you see your own? Um, say history and, and uh, um, uh, qualities uh, respond to the, the, the history here of the school and how do you see that transformation? Um, in, in part I see my history as something that's inevitable. The fact that I'm still living uh, under this roof uh, is, is, is active. You and I can determine in five or ten years what that history was looking back at it. I think the uh, aspects uh, of this program that uh, I find 
an important part to document better and to speak to better, in part have to do not only with the monumental stature of John Hiddick, which we all know is there, but the different phases that he himself went through from uh, when he was in Texas, when he was in his early years, and uh, the exercises that he did on modernism, extending the modern project, to the later period, which is in evidence uh, outside right now. Uh, I myself, uh, I mean, to speak of it, to speak of him in in that uh, context, I would say in, in in my context, I would say that the early period was interested in the. Uh, elemental nature of parts that yeah. constitute many architectures yeah. and configurative, yeah. and the later somehow lapses into a fascination with characters and yeah. figuration, which in my mind is obviously present in the work, yeah. but less interesting when it becomes icons for icons' sake. So it's, it's, it's not part of the, the era of Heideck which I find uh, uh, ironically, with uh, with the same depth uh, as the, as the early period. Obviously, it's the conversation between the two that brings a larger panoramic of appreciation to his work. But he wasn't all that there was here. Yeah. Uh, the role of Raymond Abraham to you know Peter Eisenman to Israel Sainik to uh, Lebius Wood to uh, Diana Agres to, uh, who's still here, uh, Diane Lewis, a range of other voices who have made this a space of debate, which I think is what constitutes um, the space of an institution. In that sense, if we think of this as a school of thought, I would rather we remember that it's schools of thought, or a school of thoughts, uh, the way that Elizabeth O'Donnell says it because uh, there are vast ideological differences between those very individuals, and it's the resonance and the friction that happens between their discussions that is of interest to me. And in that sense, I think constantly back to the days that we were at the AA under Alvin Boyarsky and what he really did. In Alvin's case, he didn't actually have a practice. His practice was the construction of an institution, in many ways what, what Haydick did here. Yeah. So I also see my job here, or my mission here, uh, as very different than my mission out in the field. Yeah. In the field, I'm battling you, at the same time I'm battling uh, the construction managers, you know, because it's a tough world out there. What I'm here for is to make a platform available for people to be able to do what they do better than to be told what to do. Then, then maybe going back to the work, or the, the, the architecture of the schools, because you explained a lot about sort of um, planar organization, the fab lab, and the, ele the programmatic elements that are, that are in, um, in the school, but at the same time, the the design itself, the the material assemblies, the the the, the craft that you display, um, and you spoke about uh, the stairs being, for instance, a didactic element. Do you do you think the architecture itself, um, and this is maybe also something we spoke about uh, uh, prior, does the architecture itself is you know teach the students as well, not just in its layout, but also maybe you know tying back to some of your earlier work with aggregation and material assemblies. Do you, do you see that as part of the ambition in these projects? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. But in reality, when I say that, it's the acknowledgement that any and all buildings do that yeah, for us. Of course. Um, when, when I was introduced to Victor Lundy for the first time about uh, 10, 15 years ago, yeah. uh, I was both uh, overcome with joy and, and shame at the same time to realize that certain experiments uh, that we thought were somehow novel and, uh, and somehow on the edge were, had, had been rehearsed, you know, 50, you know, uh, 50 years ago. 
So the good thing is students forget all these things. Yes, I can, I can also <laughs> read. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. So I, you know, I um, no. That's it. I mean, I, yeah. meaning we have to redo these things continuously because people tend to tend to forget them uh, as well. That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think we should look at the room as well to join these conversations. I don't know if there are people here with. It's very. We can't see. But if there's any questions, we would invite you up. Yes. I think you have to go to the microphone. To the I don't know, there's probably recordings and waivers. Robert is going to get me back from my question. Yes. Ah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting you back in front of all these people. <laughs> <laughs> I was, hi. Um, I was, I, one thing that struck me in the slides that you showed, Nader, is the uh, image of the School of Architecture at the University of Sao Paulo. Hmm. And um, it looked to me like there are things it's as if your project in Melbourne and uh, the one for us at the University of Toronto are somehow meditations on that big uh, open span space. But the thing that I was thinking about was that there, that the um, the Sao Paulo school is made out of cast concrete, and it has that kind of directness of form, which is uh, you know characteristic of a kind of construction which is largely absent and, and unavailable to us in North America and that your projects always have to deal with uh, the, me the mediated relationship between structure and surface, yeah. skin and skin and structure and that's probably enough for the question but I just, the, the thing I wanted to add to that is just that um, it seems to me that it gives you or anyone working within the North American construction system and the Australian one looks the same. It gives you liberties with the, with regard to finish and form that are different from those of um, that very direct mode of construction yeah. on Sao Paulo. So I wonder if that's something you can speak about. No, I mean, it's a it's a very important uh, recognition. I mean, uh, I I came into American architecture some twenty plus years ago, uh, having discovered. Um, Will Bruder's library in Phoenix, uh, which is a combination of those two. At one level, it's a very raw, concrete garage space that has, as a system anyway, the, the kind of the rawness of Sao Paulo. But what he does actually is that he recognizes uh, the laminar nature of finishes, the plaster, the corrugated copper, the glazing systems, not as a default acquiescence to the building industry, but he, he makes them thinner than thin. Um, and this, uh, this, the production of that tension between the raw and the cooked, what I was explaining uh, about John Wardle, is also in that same fascination. Our, our work emerges in that crack. I, I know that there were a message somewhere in here in, in the audience, and you know her and Anton's work uh, somehow is able to extend the brutality and the rawness of the work in Sao Paulo. Uh, but it requires a very specific construction industry to pull that off. Uh, and, and special circumstances. And I'm not saying that it's never possible here, but for the most part, uh, as you look at the way in which the profession has come to overwhelm uh, our relationship to uh, exit systems, strobes, fire systems, fire suppression systems, acoustic uh, uh, liners, and so forth and so on, you realize that 80% of architecture is in the reflected ceiling plan, and then the rest of it is in the, the remaining 20%. And so either you come to terms with the, um, the, the monumental importance of controlling all of those things that you never studied in school, or you become its victim. And so in many ways, uh, that's really the story that is there. It, it's, it's a yearning for uh, the visceral rawness of 
of, uh, of Sao Paulo, which by the way, has railings that are you know, lower than my knees. And so it's a dangerous building that we would all love to be able to design, but we don't have a legal recourse to. Um, and really that, uh, you know, it, there's no room for sentimentality. If you have to build guards that are higher than my neck, well, you have to de design a good one. And so this is what we've tried to come to terms with. Uh, just as a distinction though, for the most part, uh, Melbourne feels, it's not like Sao Paulo, but it has that rawness uh, of, of Sao Paulo. The, the LVL systems above are not finished. They're truly raw and you feel it, you smell it. Uh, the concrete is raw. Uh, Toronto is exactly the opposite. I mean, the... You have three dances in the laminar system you don't in Sao Paulo, right? You do. Yeah. yeah. Well, then... Well, the, the freedoms are to cover things, but in fact, they're, they're flawed freedoms. I mean, with the amount of access panels and all of the other things that um, uh, don't get, you know what the problem is? It has nothing to do with design. It has to do with your ability to orchestrate and coerce the facilities of the school, the project managers, the contractors and all of the subs to come into alignment on things that have actually been coordinated in the drawings, but to build them uh, correctly. And when they don't, your main enemy is the schedule, because nobody will reverse what they've done incorrectly to begin with. And if you can't be there 24 seven, you constantly become the victim of either the wrong poor in Sao Paulo, where you have to go back and hammer it away, or the long, wrong laminate. It's no different, actually. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you, Nader, for a fabulous talk for me. Um, thank you for a great lecture and for being able to enjoy your work and so detailed, such a detailed explanation. Um, I really like Robert's question, and I was thinking about Sao Paulo. And first of all, it's a school where there are thousands of students. So it's a very different programmatic situation, urban situation, and climatic situation, because it can be all open. But that's just an aside. Yeah. To me, uh, the question that's not being talked about not being talked, I don't know who, how, you know, but one should, in my opinion, in this context of the School of Architecture, is that there's the old, old, old expression of a formal will. And there's a formal will. It's not just, a, it's not the concrete. I don't think it's the concrete or the code or the technicality or the construction. So, sure, I like better concrete than having sheetrock. We all do, I guess, unless you really want to use wood and base materials and so on. But in the end, the way you use any of those materials goes through whatever is your approach, what's your, the discourse. I think all we do, whichever technical, uh, technical systems we use, whatever materialities we favor, whatever structural modes we would follow, there's always a relationship between that and a particular discourse. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like you to talk about that, because you didn't. You talked a little bit in the beginning, but to my opinion, to me, and in this context, um, and the way you presented the context so well, uh, in terms of discourse and education and pedagogy and all that, I'd like an answer that relates your approach to your choice of material, your choice of structure, your choice of uh, programmatic organization solution in relation to discourse today. That's what I'd like to hear. First, I'd like to say is that what's amazing about practice is how much of it is pre-orchestrated for you or somehow as a result of a collective democratic process of managing vast groups 
90% of it is decided. So your your options of working with materials aren't really there. I mean, you, you either are building in a steel city or a concrete city, or that there's certain systems in housing that are concrete because of the floor-to-floor -floor ratio and the precast systems versus uh, steel buildings. So I would say that we don't, we're not interested in selecting materials. We're simply opportunistic once we're cornered into a material system. Now that doesn't mean that we don't like materials. It simply means that, uh, that acknowledging the opportunism that comes into play is the most important thing. Because most often, you're not designing a building. Most often, you're revising the building at value engineering. The amount of waste that goes into designing buildings that get totally redesigned in the 11th hour is the biggest, biggest lesson I've learned. The other thing I would, I think, was latent in your question, which has to do with what the, the precondition to materiality is, are the larger spatial, formal, and disciplinary aspects of architectural organization to which I did not speak that much um, because they have to do with very different orders in each case. In, in, um, in Georgia, we so much inherited uh, an existing building that its spaces were predefined, and so effectively we were doing installations in a building as an extension of our uh, fascination with those buildings. Uh, but they they gain momentum because of their size, and they redescribe the space. In Melbourne, effectively, what happened was that no matter how we designed it and we went through 15 schemes, it became a mat building. So typologically, it was a building that was fat and wide and deep. So the spatial challenges came down to how you perforate uh, a building that gains no access to light and air. And the history and discourse that goes into mat buildings, uh, I think you can appreciate our are quite interesting and vast, and uh, those became uh, the the kind of the, the discursive lens through which we saw that building. How we did it is even more interesting because, despite the aesthetic similarities between John Wardle and ourselves, we think very differently. Uh, I would say that John starts a drawing at this corner and slowly makes his way across to that corner. And so for him, uh, the episodic nature of the building uh, is not only, not only does not matter, it is the, w it, it, it is the way that he structures uh, his designs and his mind. Uh, I would say that in that respect, we were constantly working hard to bring a larger organizational system into order at a grander urban scale. Why? Because for us that wasn't a building. It was a civic space in the city. And so its connection to the urban landscape, the concrete court and the Elizabeth Murdoch court is a central argument about a sequence of urban spaces that happen to be internalized along the way. From a spatial point of view, the map building is relatively benign. It's, it's pretty straightforward, modernist building, I would say. I think that begins to be challenged in, in Toronto, where the relationship between the systemic way in which the grid as an organizational system develops as a matrix for the building, but then spatially torques as you begin to uh, bend and twist the ground and the sky, uh, 
becomes something that is inventive spatially and morphologically. So despite the fact that the, the plan is a square, the experience and the qualities of the space are anything but. In the context of aspirations, I would say that the best project that maybe illustrates those aspirations is the Tongshan uh, art project, which for which we built a gatehouse, but the second and third phases were never built. That project brings certain elements of materiality, of spatiality, and the organization of those to the urban spaces that they sponsor into a, a, a larger dialogue. And I, and I have to humbly say that you know, all of us have done many projects. You've done dozens and dozens. Uh, I can only point to three or four projects that I like, and that is one of them. Hi, I have two questions. So, um, we have been pioneers in our industry, both in terms of speculations and construction methods, um, and I noticed that two of the three projects you um, talked about was um, in the special program of the School of Architecture, um, and I mean two of the th three projects were um, an expansion and or a renovation of the existing old building, um, so I'm sure you put an effort to um, um, have the have the project provoke certain discussion about um, history and future of um, our industry. So the first question being, um, what uh, position do you think an institution um, stands on um, in terms of the um, past and future of our construction methods and um, technology? And the second question being, um, I'm sure a lot of people have mixed feeling about technology. Um, on the one hand, we should, we definitely should um, take it on as a tool to to produce. But um, at the same time, it's sometimes very overwhelming, especially in our um, industry. How do you think architecture can um, not just? Uh, how do you think technology can just not just be a tool that we utilize, but also? Uh, we as architects try to create certain space that can make technology more inviting or at least not necessarily el eliminate this overwhelming feeling, but maybe alleviate? What was the last Alleviate. One? Alleviate. So oh, alleviate, I see. Part of it. Uh, these are two very different questions, so let's take them one on one. I, I think the RISI project, the, the RISI library to which I did not speak tonight, uh, which is a project of, if you like, you know, conservation, preservation, renovation, and intervention, is a good illustration about the presence and consciousness of history and the way that we position ourselves in relationship to the world. Not only in that project, but also the projects I showed today. Because in part for that project, we had to revive certain crafts and techniques that had by now become obsolete, uh, obsolescent. And so we had to actually extend the history that had ceased to exist. And that's part of the con conservation. The renovation had to do with the inevitability of that building also coming into its own obsolescence unless it inherited the uh, fire suppression systems and uh, exit signs and all of those things without which it could not survive today. So our ability to smuggle and encrypt those systems inside the classical elements was a, a strategic tactic, uh, a smuggling tactic that became part of the act of, of renovation. But that's a different ethic than conservation. And the third one was the recognition that no matter how hard we tried, we could not fit the program that we needed in that space and what intervention would do to that space. And that's a third philosophy which has to do in that case 
the ability to build off-site 7,000 square feet that could be installed in less than a month, but most importantly, recognize that we are here today in a temporal moment that will be overturned in 10 to 15, uh, 50 years. And that library will become a different program. So the reversibility uh, of, of that project in the context of a long durée of history is even more important. So I guess that, that relationship to history is a, is a pretty important one for me. Um, I mean, I don't need to hide from you what's happening in Washington DC this, uh, today is that for lack of any foresight or anticipation or a very malicious one and a very self-conscious one, uh, the history that is being written down right now is one that is precisely uh, adversarial in relationship to what may happen to us all in five years, ten years, a hundred years. So I, I think understanding history as a kind of ethical imperative is, is the answer to your question. By extension, I would only say that the history of technology is also the history of architecture itself. Um, it, your, your question was suggestive about the role of technology, but somehow there was the absence of the consciousness that the Romans built what they built precisely because of a certain technology. The Duomo in Florence was one based on the technology of its essentially constructability. Not the dome itself, but the system, the means and methods that would put it into place. The whole notion of the five points of architecture of Le Corbusier are premised on an idea about reinforced concrete, even though they are suppressed within his text. You cannot do a free facade uh, without the ability to float that facade off of the structural system. So for me, the narrative of technology and the architectural possibilities it imparts is a central one. The fact that today we're surrounded by uh, a rapidly ra radicalized set of possibilities is something that invariably we have to come to terms with, but also to come to terms with critically. Yes, I think that that was the last question. And thank you, Larry. Thank you very much.